Hi, this is Nick Williford and Manos Berlakis presenting case 294 for the manual of CTO interventions. This is a case of a CTO with eccentric calcium. The patient was an elderly gentleman who had previously PCI of the right coronary artery. He came with a non ST elevation myocardial infarction, left ventricular EF of 30 to 35%, and was found to have a 70% distal right that was stented and a CTO of the middle lady. He then had a cardiac MRI that showed improvement in the ejection fraction to 48% with viability of the LAD territory, and because of continued symptoms, he was sent for PCI of the LAD CTO. This is the coronary CT that was done for planning. We see that the left main is coming at around 3 to 4 o'clock, which is a normal takeoff from the aorta. And then uh, we do see a occlusion of the LAD, there's some calcium proximal and some calcium distal to the occlusion. On the axial views, the distance between the contralateral aortic wall and the left main was 40 millimeters, which is useful for choosing the side of the guide catheter. This is the MIP, the maximum intensity projection, that confirms what we've seen on the axial views, which is a significant calcification on the right, but also significant calcification on the LAD. The calcium seems to be proximal, but even more so, more prominent, distal to the occlusion. And uh, these are the short axis view coming from distally to proximal. Uh, we do see that there is some calcification distally, the area of the occlusion, and there's some calcification of the proximal cap. And these are the double obliques in which we're thickening the slice. What we're seeing here is, again, the significant calcium that is present distal to the um, occlusion in the LAD. This is the AI-QCT, an AI-based analysis. And we can see here in blue the presence of um, eccentric calcium. When we scroll and we go to this area, we see that there is uh, calcium on one side of the lumen. And as we move more proximally, it is more like a C, which has been associated with increased risk of perforation. And then as we come uh, uh, more proximal, then there is also some calcification, but it is not too bad. And this is the same. This is the uh, reconstructions, the multiplanar reconstructions, showing the uh, significant calcification, the eccentric calcification distally. This is the coronary angiogram. As we suspected from the CT, the occlusion is fairly short. We do see the calcium, especially distally. And there is also some calcium proximal. The right coronary artery seems to be okay. And there are some epicardials as well as some septals supplying the LAD. So based on the dual injection, we have a tapered entry. We have a short occlusion length. Actually, it seems to be shorter than what was uh, uh, described here. The distal vessel is diffusely diseased and there is the calcification and there's both septal and epicardial collaterals. Therefore, our plan was to try one degree wiring. If that didn't work, retrograde through septals and leave ADR as the last option because there are several branches, both diagonals as well as septals coming close to the area of the occlusion. And these are the patients baseline hemodynamics, sinus rhythm, and we have a good uh, blood pressure around 140 over 70 millimeters mercury. We used a turnpike LP, a polymer tapered um, guide wire, and the wire essentially flew right through the occlusion and it's going into distal branches. We confirmed with contralateral injection. And then we exchange for a workhorse guide wire followed by predilatation. We do see there's a waste into the predilatation uh, balloon. We then used the intravascular lithotripsy. This is with the arrow, uh, the newer intravascular lithotripsy catheter. We did the 120 pulses 
And then we did uh, a dilatation with a 3.0 millimeter NC after doing IVUS, which seems to expand well. There's still a little slight area of under expansion right at this area of the band, which is distal to the CTO, and that corresponds with a significant calcium. This is a coronary angiogram. We observe a significant narrowing at the origin of the second diagonal. Therefore, we decided to wire it. We used the Sasuke dual lumen microcatheter and the two operator technique in which the one operator on the back probes and the one in the front moves microcatheter. And then uh, we were able to advance uh, a workhorse guide wire into the diagonal branch. We then decided to do a Kissing balloon inflation. We used a, a 2.5 millimeter balloon diagonal and the 3.0 millimeter balloon into the LAD. And shortly afterwards, the patient started dropping his blood pressure. And this is why. So he has this uh, pretty large perforation. Interestingly, the perforation is not at the area of the CTO, it's further distally and was likely caused by the post-dilatation um, balloon. And this corresponds with the area of the eccentric calcium on coronary CT, which we had seen before. At this point, we put a balloon up. The patient had a significant hypotension requiring a CPR. But uh, then we were able to do pericardiocentesis. The CPR was very brief. We now have occlusion of the flow into the LAD. And uh, we decided that this was a large perforation. We gave some uh, uh, vasoactive, some epinephrine, with the blood pressure increasing significantly. And then, given the size of the perforation, we decided to use the ping pong guide catheter. So we used a second guide catheter, transitly deflated the balloon, got a second wire through. And then, with actual difficulty, um, we delivered a 2.5 uh, uh, by 20 and by 15 PP PK papyrus stance. And then uh, we covered it partially with uh, a drug eluting stand, both to cover the CTO, but also to potentially decrease the uh, risk of free stenosis within the covered stance. We see that there is still an area of slight under expansion, but obviously this was not the time to try to go any high pressure given what had happened before. And this is the final result, which is fairly good. There's TME3 flow into the LED. We still have flow into the second diagonal, so the covered stand did not occlude the origin of the second diagonal, and we still have the major septals. However, the patient did remain hypotensive despite. Uh, administration of blood. We did autotransfusion and gave some additional units and fluids, and his wedge was on the low side. So after the procedure was over, the patient did go for an emergency, for emergency CT, which demonstrated something fairly rare, which is an abdominal and chest wall hematoma that measured 8 by 1.5 centimeters. So part of the reason for the hypotension was that he had bleeding not only within the pericardium, but also, and likely due to the pericardiocentesis attempts, he developed a hematoma uh, within the chest wall and the erector sheath. The patient eventually did well. Uh, there was no need for intervention here. The bleeding spontaneously stopped. He was extubated and discharged six days later. So multiple lessons from this case. The first one is that uh, when there is eccentric calcium, there is a risk of perforation. And uh, when that happens, sometimes we don't realize that the patient did not have any chest pain, and we actually saw the pressure go down quickly when we realized it. So if there's hypotension, we won't understand what is going on. That's when we realized there was a perforation of the middle AD. The steps are... The same ones as for every perforation. First step, get the balloon up. The second, uh, get a cover stand. In this case, we did use the ping pong technique to minimize the time that uh, the patient had bleeding into the pericardium. The potential lesson here is that for eccentric calcium, we saw on CT, and the same was seen on intravascular ultrasound, that uh, there was... Um, increased risk of perforation. So even though we did not go high pressure, 
we did have a perforation likely at this area of severe eccentric calcification. So these are areas to avoid high pressure inflations and potentially use undersized balloons. And finally, a fairly rare potential complication of pericardiocentesis is the formation of an abdominal wall hematoma which is what happened in our patient. And this explains the persistent hypotension despite, despite training the pericardial effusion and having a nice result by echo. Thank you.